I, I want people to feel the music the same way I see it. You know, it's, it's just colors, it's it. And the rest is just painted with a little science fiction here and there. John Ridley, welcome. Thank you very much, pleasure to be here. Well, as a board member for the festival, um, we're, I want to personally welcome you, thank you. There's probably few more appropriate places for this film to play at some point. So exactly. to be here in any respect is really something to be your opening night film is really special. And you're a hell of a writer. <laughs> of course, everybody knows you won an Oscar for writing 12 Years a Slave. Yeah. But you have, I have on my bookshelf a copy of uh, Stray Dogs. Stray Dogs, which was made into the film U-Turn. I was yeah. very fortunate to have your first book made into a film by Oliver Stone with an amazing cast like that, Nick Nolte, Sean Penn, Jennifer Lopez, Joaquin Phoenix. I mean, he, you're fortunate. You know, there's, there are no two ways about it. Someone like me has just been very fortunate in my career. What yeah. brought you uh, to Jimi Hendrix and motivated you to make a movie about it? Uh, he had things about him that humbled him. They had things about him that made him probably the greatest guitarist who ever picked up the instrument. But those questions, why? You know, who were the people who influenced him? Who were the people who picked him up, who held him back? Uh, who were the people who really changed his life? And there was a night years ago, I was on the internet and I was just listening to some Hendrix rarities and one song in particular popped up. And even for someone who's heard a lot of Hendrix, even for someone who's heard a lot of songs that I thought were just absolutely amazing, this one in particular was more emotive and more emotional and reached further than I think anything that I'd heard him play before. I never heard this song, and I'm looking at the title, and it's called Sending My Love to Linda. And I started to think, well, who's Linda? Clearly, at least in my opinion, this guy was trying to communicate something, say something to this individual. You know, I wrote that for you, right? Could you tell? Yeah. How did you go about casting those roles? Everybody came to me a little bit differently. Uh, initially, when I was sitting around thinking about who could possibly play Jimmy, Andre popped into my mind. And, you know, it was a little bit of a... Here's a guy who's amazingly talented as, as a, a musical performer, but is he the right guy in an acting role? And he lives in Atlanta. I flew down there and met him. And I spent about five minutes with Andre. And his intelligence, his depth, his character, his nature, uh, everything about him, his humility, uh, his ability. You spend five minutes with a guy like that and you go, yeah, this is a guy who could actually take on Jimmy, not just as an actor, but somebody who can really interpret this guy's life. One thing that was very important for myself and for Andre is not to have some Vegas lounge act impersonation of Jimi Hendrix. I think to a degree, it's easy to just sort of put on the voice and kind of get into a hippy-dippy headspace and call yourself Jimi Hendrix. It's another thing to really have an anthropological interest in music, a real understanding of life, a curiosity about music, about art, about all of those kinds of things, uh, and then be able to act as well. Uh, Andre spent about seven months with me working on this character. He, as I said, he lives in Atlanta. He flew out to Los Angeles in about January of 2012. We worked together there uh, on many things, on playing the guitar, on voice lessons. Uh, Andre's in great shape, but Jimmy at that time period was just emaciated, so Andre lost a ton of weight. So we started working from maybe January through March, April, then he came out to Dublin where we were shooting, worked with the rest of the actors for another month or so, and then we spent you know, a couple of months shooting the film. That's a big chunk of somebody's life. Yes, but when you see his performance, you understand why it's so good, because he puts so much into it. Uh, then you add to it uh, both Haley Atwell and Imogen Poots, uh, yeah. two phenomenal young actresses. You're asking them to do one of the hardest things in the world, is to take real life characters that most people are not aware of, uh, but make them not caricatures, you know, not just the girlfriends of the rock star, but fully realized people, you know, have their own issues, their own pain, their own joy, uh, and put up with a guy who was brilliant but difficult at some point. You want to go? To Monterey? Yeah, you should go. What would your girlfriend have to say about that? Well, what was, for you, what was the toughest moment you had making this movie? I mean, did you have a point where you thought that it just, it seemed like it was just too tough to make it happen? I, you know what, that's a really good question. And these things are never, never easy. But I have to say that the last time I thought that this movie was not going to happen, I actually, you know, people have tried to make this movie in Hollywood, and, and rightly so. It's an, it's an amazing story. Jimmy is, uh, you know, he's, he's a fabric of American history. Uh, but, you know, you, you go into studios and, and doing any kind of a film, doing a biopic, those things are always kind of difficult. And I was in uh, once 
pitching this idea and, and you know, trying to explain how this version of it, just taking one year out of a man's life, is a very unique and really, in my opinion, a, a smart way to do it based on so many metrics. And I remember pitching it to the studio head and he just kind of looked at me at the end and he said, I, I, I don't get it. And to me, it's one thing if you don't like it. I mean, that, that, that's everybody's right. You know, it, it, it's art, it's, it's your opinion on whether you like it or not, but not get it, not to get history, not to get how these things really happen. To me, I, I thought that was sort of personally offensive, you know, and I really, I was kind of upset about that. I think I would have took it better if he said, you know, I don't like it as opposed to I don't get it. Yeah. And particularly because I'd spent so much time researching it and researching these individuals and talking to some of these mm -hmm. people. So at that point, I realized that this film at least this version of it was not going to get made if I was just going to hand it off to other people. And at that point, I really felt like I had to take some ownership of it, not just pitch it as a writer, go off and write the script, um, find somebody who would back me and believe in me as a director, put together this crew, put together this cast. At that point, no, there's, there's, there's no going back. When you have that many people who have that much faith in you, no, you don't, you don't ever doubt what you're doing, you don't ever doubt them, you don't ever let them down, and I hope I hope in the end result I didn't. Well, you did, and that guy made a massive mistake. Anybody <laughs> with a pulse, like it or not, right, or the music even, yeah. you have to get it. I do think, you know, you have to get history, and I do think, yeah. again, with a story like this, with these performances, there's so much about it that's so compelling, and just, you know, it is, and that's one of those things about art. You can love it or hate it, but you can't deny it, and I think this is a film that's undeniable. Well, let's raise a glass to, to Jimmy. To Jimmy and to Seattle. Over the years. Thank you very much, sir. Cheers here's to, to you. you. And here's to your movie. And Thank we'll you. see you later tonight, opening night. Absolutely. We'll have a party after the film. Thank you very much. It's my uh, pleasure. Thank you. It's just water. Uh, Mine's just water. You will be returned home safely, but forever changed.